So this is a advanced system admin class. I have structure to it, but that doesn't mean I follow it. Like this morning, I was just reacting to the system, and the first thing we have to do that's really not part of this class is to get an inventory and figure out what we have. So Carlos, we logged into Floyd 1, which was two blades, I think it was 32 CPUs, 128 gig of memory, two disk drives. And we used the topology command to look at things real quickly. And then LS SCSI. And then on Floyd 3, I have a RAID on Floyd 3, which we're going to look at on Wednesday. And uh, right now, the second disk and the RAIDs are probably not configured for anything yet. So the second Floyd 3 has four blades instead of two because I needed to put a magma chassis on it. And there's normally a Floyd 4 partition, but we don't have that partition available because I needed the slot for the magma chassis. And we're going to look at what's coming off that magma chassis on Wednesday. Okay. So you should have, be able to log into your system and be able to do a quick inventory to figure out what you got. I also covered a couple of uh, changes in the inventory stuff. System Info Gather now has uh, more verbosity, five Vs instead of just one. And also there was the SGI post upgrade script to take care of kernel modules and to do the weak updates link from the prior kernel to the newer kernel. But the dash UV is a different variant kernel, so I actually needed kernel modules built for that kernel in order to load them. And right now there is not a PTF kernel available yet with the patches that was being presented to Novell this week probably. So I'm trying to run the latest kernel, but I did have a panic this morning. That meant that I needed to go to the serial console. I grabbed the Arch KDB output, and I also grabbed a K dump, and I'm ready to follow PV once engineering uh, lets me do it. Also in the inventory, we look briefly at CPU sets. We'll come back to CPU sets on Friday. Main reason I'm starting off with CPU sets is so that it's easier for you to create memory shortage problems. Now I have to warn you, the labs were really written for two CPU Altex 350s, real old systems that were like two gig of memory. Now I'm in the 100 and 200 gigabyte of memory. So that's the hard part about some of the labs is being able to create a workload problem like swapping when everyone might have a different system that they're running on. So you got to kind of watch for that. And I'm going to try to demonstrate what I'm trying to get out of things. So let's just go through. I'm comfortable with both of you. I've had both of you before at one point or another. Again, you know me. Stop me if there's a question. I'm going to skim through slides as quick as possible, try to get to demo, try to get to doing, and get you to labs. And uh, particularly, Carlos, in your case, send me email when you are done with labs so that I'm not uh, breathing on my mail handler to help you with any questions. So I, I, for Carlos, I am checking email until 11 o'clock your time. But if you send me email and say I'm done for the day, at least I won't uh, be worried too much. I don't know that both of you have had the basic system admin class, so this is trying to leverage upon that. But I had to go through like, getting to a CMC and getting to the serial console. I've not done boots or shutdowns in labs yet. That's something that I wanted you to be trying. You will need to boot and shut down this week. Uh, your systems are already configured. And you are able to see my slide, right? Prerequisite slide. So Zipper is already configured to use DMZ server as the repository. And again, I did have to use RPM to load in some uh, kernel modules that match the kernel that I was building or running. Again, the boot and shutdown process. Uh, I am going to start later in the week introducing some problems on your systems, sucking up memory in different ways, and then having you identify 
where did all my memory go? And during the shutdown process, if I've got a large, what's called the slab, the kernel heap where all the metadata, I know it's in directories are, the shutdown may take a while. So you want to be sure that you wait till you've got a safe to power cycle type of message on the sh on the serial console before you actually do a reset. We don't want corrupted file systems if we can avoid it. Need to know basic Unix and today and tomorrow is memory, then we're going to cover IO. So uh I have a second drive on Floyd 1 for XFS and XVM. And then I also have a RAID on Floyd 3. Unfortunately, I can't have a RAID on both. So, uh, Carlos, have you worked with uh, SMEE GUI and the LSI RAID software before? Yes. Uh, Mike has not. So he, he's in a different situation. So I put Mike on Floyd 3 so that he can use the SMEE GUI stuff first. Should you want to try something because you're in different time zones, we can flip and rotate and share it. But since Carlos, I think you did have more RAID background than Mike, I gave Mike the the RAID system. And I'm going to do some demos on that as well. Also, I like people to have some site experience, be able to know what your workload is like. There is a prior class to this, the UV system analysis class. In Altex Itanium, I used to call these APET and APET2, uh, Altex Performance Evaluation and Tuning, but a lot of people thought they were application tuning, so I, I renamed the classes to be more reflective of what they're doing. And the prior class is UV System Analysis, and the System Analysis class was the old APET. And in there we get into PCP and analysis tools, profiling, uh, things of that sort. So I'm going to be applying some of that stuff this week as needed. Again, stop me if there's any questions. Normally I like a, a person to take the system analysis class and then have a couple of months before they take this class so they get a little bit of experience. Uh, in particular, I want you to be familiar with SAR, Performance Copilot, and we're going to get into top a little bit as well. So here's what we're trying to do. First of all, I am going to be going back through the data that comes out of SAR or Performance Copilot and going through the fields that are coming out of slash PROC, PROC MEMINFO, PROC STATUS, things of that sort. Now the prior class is really coming at, the prior class, the UV system analysis is really a on-the-job training. I give you a system, I give you a workload, and I give you load problems and then you try to identify. And in that class, you're kind of like an end user trying to figure out what's the system doing. In this class, we're more on the inside as an analyst and pulling apart the kernel itself and trying to look at memory scheduling, memory management, CPU scheduling, I.O., stuff like that. So where we're going today is resolving memory issues and talk about mem info in particular. I see a lot of questions all the time about where did memory go. That's what I want you to be able to know. In particular, the most important thing for today is understanding PROC MEM info. And also being able to look at it on a per node basis. Now that will go into tomorrow. So tomorrow, I generally am, am breaking in the middle of memory issues and then tomorrow I'll cover memory and swap issues. Typically, in my stand-up lecture classes, the first two days are memory. And I want to be able to do demos and stuff like that, too. The second two days, then, are I.O. Now, I may start the lecture portion tomorrow, but be able to figure out how your file system is built and talk about file system tuning. I will repeat this several times, but when I'm tuning, the way I'd say it is, the more I know my workload characteristics, the more I understand my workload, the more responsible my configuration decisions are. And in the I.O. area, I want to know what my I.O. request sizes are like. So we're going to be using things like S-Trace and things of that sort to look at my I.O. path. 
So end of tomorrow, into Wednesday, we want to talk about the, the SAR-D data and what my file system are doing. Then we're going to get into configuring XFS. And I don't know why I didn't list it here, but also XVM. Oops. But also I want to get into XVM and striping. And I also want to get into RAID. They just don't happen to be on this slide. So Wednesday and Thursday are basically I.O. Monday and Tuesday memory, Wednesday, Wednesday Thursday I.O., and then Friday would be CPU. And part of Thursday is going to be this buffer cache issues. And in particular, we're going to get into the sysctl uh, vm dot dirty underscore ratio, for example. Uh, now, I think both of you have been exposed to the sysctl command before, but that's going to be the first thing today. We're probably going to pick through about 40 of the sysctl parameters, and there will be dedicated labs for you to play with this stuff. So let me save that for later in the class. Uh, generally, I do not have time for IPC. I'm just going to mark that off, take that off the list. Friday, then, I want to talk about the CPU scheduler, and I want to talk about CPU sets. Now, I've placed you in a CPU set now just to make it easier to create memory pressure problems. Okay, and keep in mind, the way it's configured right now is both the boot and the login CPU set are on the same memory node. And if I suck up all that memory in the login CPU set, it's going to be hard for me to log in in the boot CPU set. Both of you have the option of reconfiguring that nothing underscore local script and to pick a different socket so that the login is completely separate socket from the boot CPU set. But right now I wanted you to have memory pressure problems there. And I am also, when you come in in the morning, going to create a problem for you. So Mike, it'll be a little bit different. You'll probably be doing labs, but before class starts, I'm going to try to create a couple of problems on your systems. And I'll let you know ahead of time when it's okay to suck up memory with something. Also, we will use in context, but being able to look at system time. And in particular, there is a new command. I'm not sure if you've used it yet, called perf. And I'm going to be using something called perf top. Now, Big attention here, don't use perf top on anything other than the latest SP2 kernel. In SLES 11, SP1, perf top will deadlock your system and you won't even be able to NMI it. In uh, SLES 11, SP2, perf top could result in you dropping to KDB. And this is why I have that dash UV kernel, because perf top is fixed in that one, so that perf top is safe. And that's why I'm trying to use the latest software stack this week to see if I can panic it. And I already did get a panic, but it was not related to perf top. So I want both of you to write down a big note here. Don't use perf top unless you're running a UV kernel or a PTF kernel once it's made available. We're not at a PTF state yet. Is that clear enough? Perf top on SLES 11 SP1 will deadlock your system, and that's real bad. But I'm going to be using perf to look at system time during the week. Any questions? So I want to get through this introduction real quickly here and get to a CTL section and then virtual memory. And I'll probably stop somewhere in virtual memory here. I'm going to go about four hours each day, but I kind of lost an hour today with uh, uh, dealing with the kernel and the inventory stuff. So tomorrow in the general when I'm doing this class live in the classroom, 
virtual memory definitely goes into the second day. And then I try to start the lecture of the file system module, but not actually do the lab. So really, Monday and Tuesday are memory, Wednesday and Thursday are I.O. So, uh, and again, this is the hard part for Carlos. You've only got two disks, so it's not a very fancy file system. Even for uh, Floyd 3, I don't have a fancy file system because I don't have enough spindles to do a variety of different things. I'd like an LVM and an MD and an XVM. I'd like concats. I'd like uh, stripes, combination type of stuff. So this is the hard part for any site is to figure out how is the file system built. So I might go to a site that has 100 drives with failover configured. And by the way, failover is not configured, Mike, on Floyd 3. And I need to talk about failover later. But file system layout will get into drawing out your file system. And if you see a particular drive to go busy, to know what file system it is and know how that file system is built. So I was at United States Postal Service and they had an Excel spreadsheet showing all the LUNs and how they're put together into their file systems. Then on Wednesday, I want to talk about LSI RAID. I am not talking DDN at all. And this is where I will use Floyd 3 and the SMEE GUI to look at how the RAID is built that's there right now. And then, Mike, I'm going to want you to rebuild the RAID, to tear it apart and play, play with it a little bit, just to get familiar with the GUI for you. And then XVM. Now, the RAID that I've got on Floyd 3, I actually have five LUNs being exported. Four of them are for a Stripe group from XVM, and the fifth LUN is for a external log. So that's something that I do in this class is build an XFS file system with an external log or journal. We're not there yet, but the external log or journal is for metadata intensive environments to protect the file system tree so that every time I boot, I can use the journal or the log to repair and recover my file system quicker. So the journal's purpose is to protect the integrity of the file system tree if I'm reboot, I find an orphaned file that doesn't seem to fit into the tree anywhere. The journal will tell me where to put it back into the file system rather than putting it into lost and found. So when I'm talking XVM in this class, we're going to be talking about bandwidth and striping. When I'm talking XFS, I'm going to be talking about metadata intensive environments where I have lots of journaling activity and talk about XFS statistics. And then we're going to talk about the flush daemon and buffer cache and how memory is managed when I run out of memory. Talk about when I write data, data going from dirty to write back, write back to clean. Friday then will be CPU. So I want to get into CPU sets, I want to get into affinity, NUMA tools and basically get, get into a CPU bound situation. We okay? Any questions? So this is just kind of review. What is tuning? I am not covering code optimization in this class. That's kind of the prior class. What we're going to be really talking about in this class is resource management. Talking about how is memory managed? How is the CPUs managed? How is I.O. managed? Again, sizing or matching my workload and my system. This is where I need to run my application. I cannot tune a, a, I cannot tune a machine until applications are running. As I said before, the more I know my workload characteristics, the more responsible my configuration decisions are. And I always want to try to fix the application first. NASTRAN is a good example of that. NASTRAN is a vibrational modal analysis type of program they use for car door vibration studies. And it has a couple of parameters when you start it to say, how much memory do I want to use for scratch and what kind of I.O. request sizes do I want to do? And those are appropriate questions in this sizing type of thing. 
The other thing, this is what we're really talking about this week, is how to reconfigure software to match your workload. So the more I know my workload, the more responsible these decisions are. So we're going to talk about SysCTL settings, and they are very critical on large UV systems. UVs are different than everything else because we're into terabytes of memory. Keep in mind, by default, half my memory can be dirty. Half my memory, dirty data is data that is not synced yet. If I type the sync command, it flushes the dirty data to disk, and then it becomes clean. If half my memory is dirty, and I have a 16 terabyte machine, and I have eight terabyte of dirty data, you're gonna be in trouble. So a lot of these memory management parameters are set upon the size of memory, and since we have much bigger memories than everyone else, we have the ability to overrun the kernel and get too much dirty memory, for example, and then it starts choking on it. I do want to create load problems this week. And I have sites that have memory load problems all over the place. Not part of this class, but the other thing then would be back off on the workload with PBS. I do have PBS installed and running on Floyd 3, but not on Floyd 1. And also adding more hardware, which is not relevant in this class. Also part of tuning is just trying to match site expectations to the workload demands. And these large UVs that are maybe 256 sockets are a different kind of computer than the itaniums that we had before. And I need to explain some of the differences there. You don't want to spread everything across everything. One of the key things in a UV is to keep my interconnect traffic down. I don't want to be using NumaLink. Just because NumaLink's there doesn't mean I want to use it and abuse it. Your best performance is going to be able to, is to be able to stay on socket. If I have to go to the other socket that's on the, the blade, there's going to be a, a latency and a performance hit. And if I have to go off blade, there's going to be a big performance hit. And by default, all my I.O. is being spread across all my nodes, and that creates contention on the NumaLink and can have performance impact. So these sites are getting four racks of UV equipment and this huge memory. They need to manage that memory in a different mindset. And I've seen a lot of sites try to do it like an itanium where they're trying to do memory allocation round robin across all nodes, and that is bad on a UV. It was good on Itanium. And I need to talk about that as we go along. Any questions on this slide? So when I get into a drill, and I'm going to be doing this in the next day or so, but this is part of the prior class, when I get into a situation where I have a, a, an event occurring, negative performance impact, like interactive response being poor, I'm going to check CPU first, see how busy they are, see what my load level is like, what's my user time, my system time, my IO wait time. Then I'm going to check memory and mem info and see how my memory is being used, including node info for my per socket memory usage. Then I'm going to check my disk drives to see how busy they are. So all these three things are with a, like a SAR command or performance copilot. After that, file system buffer cache. Now when I say file system, I mean metadata, inodes, directories. All that metadata, all that file system data is in what's called the slab. And I want to try to get big slabs this week. I may deliberately try to grow the slab. I might just do it on Floyd 2, or I might try to do it on all three of you, but I'll, I'll tell you if I'm going to do something to your system. Buffer is for the write traffic, and that's the flush daemon. And cache is for the read traffic. Now, Linux people will call this stuff page cache, but I've kind of broken them out into three separate pieces. Also, and I intend to burn you with this, inter-process communication. Interprocess communication be like uh, 
ls on slash dev slash shm or ipcs dash am. Those two things will tell me about the interprocess communication. Now, the important thing to realize here is that this stuff is allocated in memory, and it is up to the user and the program to remove them when they're done. And if a user doesn't clean up after themselves, if they create a file in DevShemem, it can create a node that is out of memory. And now you get a process that gets onto that socket, but there's no memory on the socket and it has to go off socket to get memory, and now you've got a performance hit. So I need to try to show you what I mean here. Uh, by default, dev shemem is allocated first touch. So I could uh, run on a CPU, create a 10 gig file, or let's say a terabyte file, and now I'm out of memory on that node. And if I don't remove the file, when I'm done with it, nobody else can use the memory on that node, and they now take performance hits. And I'm going to say numbers like a 40% performance hit, 40% degradation, when I'm going across the interconnect, going across NumaLink. Worst case scenario. So watch for that. I intend to burn you with that. I intend to create some memory leaks using Shemem. Now for me, I am 100 miles away from the equipment, so my networks aren't too bad. But Mike, being overseas, you're going to have a lot more network issues than I would. And I would not try to run a GUI across the Atlantic. Same thing with you, Carlos. Uh, VNC Viewer would be more efficient. But I need to make sure that VNC Viewer is working correctly. Uh, I tried it this morning with Mike, and it panicked the system. After you've got all that looked at, then you deal with things like the graphics, the GPUs, things of that sort. We're not going to focus on any of that. So when I'm analyzing and identifying my problem, I then sort out my solutions. I want to fix the application first. I need to deal with file system layout. There are sites that will live with a poorly designed file system for years before they fix them. The problem with redesigning a file system is service interruption for a day or two. What do I do with all the data that was on that file system? And just all the overhead of moving my data from one file system offline and then onto the new file system. So sites will often have file system problems for years before they make changes. After that, deal with the CPU scheduler and CPU sets in particular, and then get into the file system buffer cache. This actually, nowadays, I'm handling almost first. We're going to talk about some sysctl parameters that are critical on a large memory UV. And again, the next day we're going to talk about memory utilization and how it's being used and what's, where did all the memory go. We'll talk a little bit about paging, TLB misses, and swapping. And lastly, talk about networks and scheduling, which I really don't care about. So. When I'm into the situation, the first thing I can do is inventory the system. That system info gather will give you everything that you need. And I did a quick inventory this morning with topology and LSCSI and DF. By the way, I did not warn you, but the systems are NIS, so that that home directory has an NIS account. And uh, Carlos? I'm going to give you TNG01. So Carlos, when you're running things not as root on your system, I want you to use TNG01. And Mike, I'm going to have you use TNG03. If you were to both use the guest account, you would possibly step on each other. So just be careful of that. So there are some lab scripts that you're going to run that could, if you both ran them as guests, you could end up stepping on each other. So just be a little careful of that.
So NIS is configured, and we do have guest and TNG accounts available. After I know what I've got for a system, then I got to figure out what my performance metrics are. I don't care about that in this class. That is the prior week. So I'm really not uh, looking at any particular performance metrics. Basically, I'm only interested in subjective interactive response. Instrument the system. I'm hoping that the system is already instrumented. Let me do something here. I'm going to go off to my desktop. So I'm on Floyd 1 here. I'm just going to type in SAR, and that is working. I'm going to do an ls-l on slash var log pcp pm logger. And it does look like pm logger. Let's see, do a date. March 26th. Why do they say March 9th? Okay, so I'm going to check on this right now. Uh, PS E, let's grep for PM logger. Not running. I'm going to go into var lib PCP config PM logger. Just checking here. I have my own config file here. Let me take a look at it. So I'm saving PCP data every five minutes or 300 seconds, and I'm saving basically the full set. Now, let me check for control. And here's why I do not have anything working right now. I'm going to uncomment this. Sys A was the file that I had. Are you okay? Carlos and Mike, you following me? Yeah. So I'm just yeah. checking my instrumentation here. Now I'm going to go, oh, let me RM on the var log PCP PM logger Floyd 3, no this is Floyd 1, that's fine, so now let me do a service PCP start. Looks like it started okay. Let's just see what we've got here. And we do now have a PCP file running there. Let me check Floyd 3. So PS-E, let's grep for PM logger. Not running, probably the same thing. Var, lib, PCP, config, PM logger. I'm going to check the control file and do the same thing. Now this is all part of the prior class. Oops. Ah, come on. Sys A. I want to check SAR D or SAR, that's working. SAR D, good, that one is also working. There was a bug in SAR D, but I'm okay with that. The other thing that I should do here though, check config PMIE, performance metric inferent engine. I would have called it PM alarm. This is an alarm mechanism that says if a PCP metric goes 
breaks a rule and goes outside of range, that we will write something into var log messages. So I'm going to do a PMIE conf. Notice where the config file is going to be. I'm going to type in rules, and I'm going to disable the CPU.low utilization. Now this is being done also so that I turn on the default rules. Now when I do a quit, notice it now has a new config file. If I do a more on that, I can now see everything that's being checked, like context switches we'll talk about, load level, CPU utilization. Those are what the rules look like. I'm going to do a service PMIE restart. Any questions? Are we okay? Let me check one now. So let me go here. If I take a look at my config.default, yep, it's got everything configured. Good. So I just wanted to check that. So I've got PCP conf uh, being used now. Are we okay? Also, on Floyd 3, I do have CSA running. Oops, I thought I did. Oh, I guess not. Okay, for both of you, CSA is not officially supported within Performance Suite anymore, but I still like to use it. If you are somebody that works with it or uses it, this is the accounting package from Cray Days and stuff. So we can still use them, we're just not officially supporting them. And then I have to edit, let me go in here, uh, it's the pam.d, bi common dash session, and I'm going to stick in a uh, pam underscore job library. I'm going to log out, log back in, type in JSTAT, oh, oh, let me first of all check config, job on, CSA on, that's okay, I'm not going to worry about that, service, job, start, Service CSA start. Log out. Log back in. JSTAT. And I do now get a job ID. And if I type in CSA com, I now have every process that I run and I get an accounting record for it. I'm going to do a CSA run just to clean up that stuff. Now, one of the things I like about CSA that is relevant to me is CSA com as a dash W option for wait times. And I can actually see CPU wait, IO wait, and swap wait. You can also do a JA command. Let me just do something here. Let me go into home guest. Actually, I think it's just in my current directory here. 
So I've got a code here. I'm just going to run this one here. Dot slash code 203. Okay, that's done. Let me do it again just with a time command on it. So I'm dealing with instrumentation, which I'm just checking it before we move on. And again, Carlos, I don't care if CSA is loaded on your system or not. Since uh, Floyd 3 is the bigger system, I may be creating problems there. By the way, this code 2 should be able to get down to 8 seconds, but I'm still at 12 seconds. And a lot of that is due to latency. But I also have to check to see if I've got an Intel library difference going on, too. Any questions right now? Are you both still there? Still here. So now if I type in a JA-S for summary, E for extended, now I actually see details about everything that was in that login session or job. So I've been logged in 51 seconds since I started the uh, JA command, 23 seconds of user, no system time, uh, high water memory marks, only got to 21 meg, no real data transferred, number of read and write system calls, and then here's my CPU weight, my IO weight, and my swap weight. Okay, and if I go into user include Linux, I believe it is, there is a taskstats.h, and this is the structure that CSA accounting is using, showing me there's my block delays, my CPU wait time, my swap wait time my user ID, my command name, group ID, process ID, parent ID, time that I began, elapsed time, user time, system time, page faults. A minor page fault is a TLB miss, and a major page fault is bringing something, something in from the swap device. High water memory marks, bytes transferred, system calls, I'm just myself looking to see. There is something that they've added that CSA does not have called free pages as well. So this is time waiting for a memory trim. And I'm going to be using that this week as well. Context switches as well. Context switch is when I disconnect a process from the CPU and connect a new process to the CPU. We okay with that? Now, if you're really interested, I have a little command called task logger that can actually attach to a running process and get the data that we were just looking at without CSA. So this is just another uh, instrumentation tool to attach to a running process and see what the CPU weight counters look like. Now there is an official tool called get delays, and the man page is not correct. You gotta make a note of that. So if I do a get delays, I'm just gonna type it. It gives me a little bit different syntax. So I'm going to do a get delays dash D to print the statistics we're talking about. I'm going to also try an I and an L, which I don't think is actually working, and then a dash P dollar dollar. Let's see if this works. And there we are now. So I'm actually listening to my current shell. And then here's my IO weight, my swap weight, my memory trim weight. This is what CSA did not provide me. I'm also able to see bytes transferred and stuff. 
Now let me try something else here. So instead of doing it that way, let me do a home cast real WL code seven. Oops. Uh thought I could run as a child, but I guess not. Four six one four six. And it's not working correctly as I suspected. I'm gonna get rid of the L and put it under watch. And now you can see it's actually working here. So I can actually see the CPU time. Look at the IO wait time that's going on here. So I'm talking about instrumentation. I got SAR working. I got PCP PM logger working. And then I jumped to accounting data. PBS has its own accounting data as well. And then I've jumped to this uh, task stats data. And CSA gets to it, and then I had that task logger command that can get to it, and the get delays command that can get to it. I don't know why the L option isn't working. I need to make a note of that too. Hey, what's that dash C option? That might have been to run the command. Where were we? Uh, this, I think, would be for uh, CPU sets and containers, the big C, but I don't know anything about it. But I think that would be a, a CPU set one, but again, I don't know anything about it. Haven't used it. Any other questions right now? Are we okay? One of the other things I forgot to do, by the way, I need to put the cron tab in place. And that'll make sure that PM logger is up and running. If PM logger goes away, it will restart it. We okay so far? I'm not hearing any questions, so that's okay with me if you're okay. Now, the other instrumentation that I'm going to check out here right now, and this is going to be the hard part for you, I have loaded PCP onto my Windows system. So I am running distributed here. Now I'm hoping both of you have used PM chart at least once before in a prior class. Okay. I'm going to go to my browser here, oss.sgi.com slash projects slash PCP. I'm going to click on download. So there's the path. But you can start off with oss.sgi.com. Now, PCP is now all open source, and there is a, a set of binaries or whatever, Debian, for Mac OS. There is the source. There's some Perl and Python. The RPM directory is for Red Hat, not for SLES. So if I'm on SLES, I either grab the SGI Foundation RPMs, or I grab the source here and build it from the source. And PM chart and the GUI are all open source now. I also have Solaris and Windows. So this is the one that I did. I downloaded, I don't know which one I did. This one's, yeah, I must have been that one. It's been a year since I've gotten a new, newer Windows version, it looks like. So I downloaded that, and then that's an installer, and that put PCP on my Windows system. 
Are you okay? Can I go on? So I'm going to do this now to save time. I'm going to open view and select CPU. Notice I've got to specify which host I want. And I'm going to go to floyd3.sgi.com or by IP address if you need it. And it did correctly connect. In order for that to work, I need to have PMCD running. If PMCD is not running or I cannot connect to its open socket, then PM chart would have complained. So I've got CPU. Let me move this out of the way here. I'm going to hit open on Floyd 3, and I now have my CPUization chart. Time executing code in user mode. Time in the kernel doing system time. Anything that's been nice, like cron events, interrupt handler time, I await time, and steel is for virtualization. If I have a guest operating system running under my parent operating system, Zenworks, VMworks, that sort of thing, that would be steel. Now, if you are working with virtualization, steel only is counted when I run out of, when I'm no longer idle. Otherwise, virtualization shows up as system time. So that guest operating system will get counted as system time until I have no more idle. At that point, the guest is actually stealing CPU cycles from me. So virtualization would show up as system time until I no longer have idle. Then it would be stealing cycles from my users. Any questions right now? I'm going to open up a view again. This time I want swap. So I have swap free and swap used. And in lab, you're going to replicate this. And I want you to, by tomorrow, have the ability to use PM chart on Floyd 3 because I want to start creating problems tomorrow on Floyd 3. Are we okay? Yeah. Let me know if I'm losing you. Again, this is being recorded for a playback, too. Now, the third uh, chart that I want to build here, I'm building my own custom chart. Let me cancel that again. I'm going under New Chart. And I'm going to create my own chart. And this is personal preference. I'm going to go to Memory, Utilization, and I want to build, I don't know how much... Uh, IRIX background you had and gross view. So I'm trying to build a gross view type of chart. And I'm going to go through this and explain this after a break and stuff like that. We've got a couple of things to cover. So I'm going to start off, let me find a good one here. I'm going to start off with page tables. The page table is what keeps track of my virtual to physical page mappings. When I take a TLB miss, the processor doesn't know the physical location of the page, so it takes a TLB miss to the kernel, and the kernel then goes to the page table to get to the physical address and puts that back into the TLB buffer of the processor. So I'm going to add page tables over here. Then I'm going to add slab. Now, this is part of the memory. We'll come back to this later, but slab is the kernel heap. So this is where inodes, directories, process table entries, all kinds of things are in the slab. There is a slab top command to show me what's in the slab. So the slab will grow and shrink. And I am seeing slabs in the uh, 100 gigabyte range. I'm seeing slabs that are way too big on some of these systems, and that is creating performance problems. So I want you to understand when the slab is a problem. 
And again, the slab is the kernel heap that grows and shrinks when the kernel needs space for like inodes, directories, uh, process table entries, things like that. Question? We're going to come back to this. After that, I'm doing buff mem. Buff mem is what's called raw I.O. By raw I.O., I mean we're going straight into slash dev. Buff mem, raw I.O., there is no inode, no directories, no file system table information. For example, Oracle and Times 10 will do raw I.O. straight into slash dev. XFSDB, the XFS defragger, XFS repair, make swap. These are commands that do raw I.O. Are you okay? Yeah. yeah. Now, I want you to write this down. Also in BuffMem raw I.O. are my journals, my, my logs, my internal logs. XFS has a finite set of raw buffers for the journal. Extended 3, Extended 4 does not. So you could have a large buff mem that is the journaling activity for the file system. If I am taking an email storm, email spam attack, I could have a large buff mem that is all my journaling activity. I have seen buff mems get to 100 gig that was just my journal. So XFS it is a finite size for the journal, but extended 3, extended 4, it can use all of memory for the journal. Now why do I care? If I do a shutdown, all the slab and all the buff mem, any metadata storm that's going on, is going to show up in slab and buff mem, and it may take me an hour or two to shut down my system, and I want a clean shutdown. So before I do shutdowns, I like to know how big my slab and my buff mem are. I intend to drive, if I can get my way, I intend to get a 100 gig slab and a 100 gig buff mem of journaling activity on Floyd 3 and then show you what that's like. And if these things are big, there is going to be a performance impact from them. So my point was buff mem on extended 3, extended 4 could be large journaling activity from an email spam attack. I'm going to run a program called Postmark that I call Code 5 so you don't know what it is. And Postmark is a benchmark tool to create a metadata storm without the network load behind it. So BuffMem is raw I.O. And it has uh, anything going into slash dev, but what I was trying to warn you about is extended three roots that we have now could also have a large journal that's in BuffMem. And again, XFS has a finite, like eight buffers, but with extended three, extended four, there is no limit to the amount of memory that the journal can use. Are we okay? Stop if there's a question. And we're going to come back through this stuff. Right now I'm just dealing with instrumentation. Okay, so slab is the kernel heap, buff mem is raw I.O. The next thing I'm going to plot is my dirty. So dirty data is data that my program has done a write on but has not flushed to disk yet. When I type in the sync command, dirty data will start flushing. Also Thursday, we will talk about sysctl parameters that control flushing. So by default, if 10% of my memory gets dirty, or if it's older than 30 seconds, that would also start flushing dirty data. If I take a service interruption, panic, Dirty data never made it to disk, and I have a corrupt file. So the flush daemon will flush when it's more than 10% dirty, while a 16 terabyte machine means I could have 1.6 gig, or I'm sorry, 1.6 terabyte of dirty data before I start flushing. That is too much dirty data. 
So Thursday, we need to talk about CCTL dirty ratio and dirty background ratio to prevent too much dirty data. Okay, so flush has a threshold, dirty ratio, dirty background ratio, and also by age, if it's older than 30 seconds, dirty expires centiseconds, and we need to talk about those Thursday. That will take dirty data and start flushing it. So when I start flushing it, it gets marked as write back. So write back data is data that has been marked to flush, but is not flushed yet. It has not actually finished the sink. So write back data is data that is in the process of flushing. I really do not want to see write back data. And if I'm on a system and I got a terabyte of write back data, I have a problem. My file system is not keeping up with my dirty, and I need to figure out what's going on. You do not want to be able to see write back data. We want to flush the data and not get 16 terabyte, or I should say, 8 terabyte of dirty data. I don't want 8 terabyte of write back data, or I'm in trouble. Dirty and write back memory cannot be used by anything else. That memory is not recoverable until it is successfully flushed and is coherent out on disk. We okay with that? We're going to come back through this stuff. Now if I'm writing to an NFS server, then it goes to NFS unstable. And this is where I'm seeing a lot of problems where I may have half my memory in a dirty write-back situation because NFS cannot keep up. And I intend to do this to you tomorrow. So NFS unstable, if I write to an NFS server, it goes to dirty to write back, and then from write back to NFS unstable, and then once the NFS server has it, it then goes clean. So that's the next one I'm going to add in is clean. So cache clean is coherent data. It has successfully flushed. Now that does not mean that it's on the spindle. The RAID controller and the spindles have a cache on them. So cache clean simply means that it is off the mainframe and the spindle cache or the RAID controller cache may have it, but I've already got my I.O. done. And there are configuration changes to the RAID cache and the spindle cache on how that cache is handled for write cache enabled or write bypass. We will talk about that later. So cache clean simply means that the sync has finished, that the dirty data is coherent, but it does not say whether it's actually on the spindle yet. Now cache clean is something that PCP is deriving, and it goes back to IRIX and gross view. Any questions? After cache clean, Anon Pages is my process space. So again, when I'm looking at memory, I'm looking at file system buffer cache. File system was my slab and buff mem. Buffer cache was buff mem, dirty, right back, NFS unstable and clean. So I got one, two, three, four, five, six counters there that describe my file system buffer cache. And then Anon Pages is my process space. Okay. After Anon Pages, I am going to go to Mapped. Now, Mapped is not mapped data. If I do a man on MMAP, You would think that this is what's counted in mapped, but it isn't. I'm going to do this real quickly. Memhog 100 gig. Oops. Let me do an S trace on it. Dash O. I'm just going to call it file. So memhog is growing right now. And we will be using memhog to create memory pressure problems. 
And remember, I'm in a boot seep, you said, that only has 64 gig to my node, and I asked for 100 gig. Let me break out of this, do a more on file, where I was actually saving everything here. And one of the things about uh, S-trace outputs is you want to skim read them. You don't want to get stuck line by line. And right here, here's where I asked for my 100 gig. It actually came out to be 107 gig in octal. So here is how I asked for memory. But that does not get counted as mapped. That is not the mapped field. That will only show up in the non-pages. Mapped is actually IPCS type of stuff. So mapped is the IPCS-AM is this stuff here. Now I'm going to come back to this. Are we okay? Any questions? Again, today and tomorrow is memory, and this is introduction, but I'm going to come back through this and, and actually make these numbers do things later. After mapped, I'm just looking here. I'm not going to add in Shemem right now. I'm going to do that later. And all I really want is free memory that is not allocated. So this is all personal preference. But now I'm going to do an apply. And cancel. I'm going to do a open view. And I want to get disk now. to Floyd 3. I'm also going to open view and I want to get file system space. I want to watch my file system. Let's see, where is it? Right there. And then I'm also going to do one more on the network. Let me go by net bytes. So I now have a generic PCP PM chart that I've almost customized. Now see this blue up here? If I click down here, see the blue changed? Wherever I click, that is the current chart that I can work with. I'm going to click on the memory one because I wasn't finished with it. So you notice that it turned blue over here. So now I'm going to uh, uh, go under edit chart and now I can make changes to the chart. First of all I'm going to add in memory utilization. Uh, spelled the American way my and I'm going to create it as a stack bar and I'm going to apply and I now have a stack bar chart here. I also do not like the colors here. So I want to pick a non-pages, and I'm going to go over here and make that thing a blue. And I'm going to make free a green, a real bright green. And uh, this is all personal preference. I'm going to make that one a red. You can do what you want, but I like dirty to be red. And buff men, I'm going to put into like a magenta or something. Let's see, something like that, which is real close to right back. Let me change right back to uh, cyan or something. So I'm just picking colors. I like free to be green. A lot of this goes back to gross view and irix. I like process space to be blue, and I like dirty to be red. So I'm going to apply that and hit cancel. And notice 
I've got all these uh, legends down here in a, a slider bar now. I can click on one of these and take it out of the view, deselect it. We okay? Any questions? So now that I've done that, I am going to save this view. Now, I've got a whole bunch of saved already. Let me just call this all.floyd3. But I've got views from prior classes too. Now I also like to do a open tab. I'm going to do memory. Click on that one. I'm going to try open view and click on this head up here. <coughs> And here's all the ones that were there before. I'm going to click on Floyd 3 here and open it. So there's the view that I saved before. I'm just trying to show you how to use PM Chart here, and I'm going to close some of these charts. I want to have just memory because mem memory is so important. I'm just trying to get where that's the only thing that I have. Now if I click on live, let me get this back up here. I got everything here, but this this is kind of hard. It's too small. So now if I click here, now I've got a better view of just memory. And personal preference again, I'm going to add a new chart to this one, and I want Shemem for shared memory. Good enough. Uh, let me edit that one again. Add a chart. Oops. I wanted a stack bar. I'm going to add one more tab here. Open view. No, let me hang on here. Add tab. This one I'm going to call NumaLink. And I am going to create a new chart. And because I'm on a UV, it is able to have this UV group here. I'm getting link stat data, so I want the uh, NumaLink traffic. And I'm just going to do it by bytes. Notice I've got each of the blades with four ports coming out of the hub for each blade. I'm just going to select them all, add them over here, and apply. Now, I do not have data yet. Oh, let me just bring up one down here. There's Floyd 3. So I'm going to do a link stat, dash <coughs> capital A. Oh, I'm sorry. Link stat dash UV. And now I am getting link stat, NUMA link traffic data as well. So let me say this one, I'm going to now save view as uh, I was just going to call it memory. <coughs> and then I'm going to file save view here, and I was just calling it NumaLink. So I now have the ability to have these three charts and to pull them up. Also, I'm going to edit number of samples. I, I like to have more samples visible here. See how these are kind of wide for me, the, the reds down here? That's a little bit coarse for me. And now I like it better. I can see more data, more, more time here. 
see what we've got here. 906 to 911, about five minutes worth of data that's visible in this window. And let me just check memory again. And let me check Numalink. I can see there are a couple of nodes here that actually have more traffic going on on them. And I can go down here and click. Uh, let's see. So there's one of them, R1, I1, Blade 6, Hub Port 3 is one of those colors there. And I'm going to just try the other one here, not that one. I'm looking for the green one. There's the other one, Blade 4, Port 3. So I've got two ports that seem to have more traffic going across them than the other ports. Are we okay? Any questions? Okay. So I've got everything saved and everything else, so I'm just going to close this off and go back to the slides. If there aren't any questions, I've got my instrumentation in place now. Now tomorrow I'm going to actually start creating some load problems and we'll monitor the workload and also again know my resource requirements, know how much CPU memory and I.O. my applications run. <coughs> also I do not have this yet, long-term baseline. Let me check something here. deal with that later. I'm not sure if you're familiar with ganglia, but I do put ganglia on my Floyds as well. I don't want to deal with that right now. But that would also be helpful for my baseline. And then the SAR command, <coughs> also helpful for my baseline. Okay. So tomorrow I'm going to start creating problems, but People always ask what's a good number or bad number. I need a baseline to get that. How many contact switches am I typically doing on my system? What's my system time like? Things of that sort. Let's move on. So once I've identified a problem, I'd like to fix the application first. That's a different class. What we are in in this class is configuration choices based upon the workload. Then getting into batch systems to back off on the workload so that you don't have too much work running. Reduce your run levels. Don't oversubscribe things. Sometimes offload diverse workloads. For example, you might have a web server and a database server. Rather than running them on the same system, you might uh, partition them and NumaLink them together. Sometimes you do have to reset customer expectations. These large memory systems, uh, I oftentimes have to make the customer think about what they're doing because I don't agree with what they're doing. One of the key things is this NumaLink and interleave versus first touch. And I've had sites that will take a boot or a login CPU set and spread it across all the IRUs rather than keeping them tightly coupled together. On an Itanium system, the memories were off the hub and we would do an interleave quite a bit. But on UV, the memory is off the socket. So on a itanium, we would often try to spread things around. But on a UV, we want to have things tightly coupled. And we want to make sure that CPU sets are on within the same IRU, same rack, and are on NumaLink hardware-friendly boundaries. Okay. So I had one site with four racks, and they took a blade out of each IRU. So that was eight blades, one in each IRU, that they put together a CPU set with. But that is not the way I would advise you to do that, because that created NumaLink traffic across uh, 
a, a high latency interconnect. And I would rather put all those eight blades in the same IRU and have them tightly coupled. That is the way I would prefer to do it nowadays. <coughs> but that's an example of customer expectations. Also managing dirty memory so that you don't have dirty memory. Managing dev shemem because that can create memory leaks. So there are a lot of different areas where I have to re-educate the customer on a UV type of system. Of course, adding or upgrading the hardware or sites will live with the abuse on the system. Okay, there's information on docs.sgi.com. We have an application tuning guide. There's a resource management guide. There is the uh, RAID guide for the SME eGUI. And there is a Linux UV configuration operation guide as well. Additional references. SLES, Novell has a very good document here. This one is rather uh, verbose. Actually, no, what, the one I'm thinking of might be this one here. This one is a very relevant one for this class, and this is free. Also for this class, Robert Loves, Linux Kernel Development. This one is big. It's got like 400 pages to it. So I generally do not print that one off. For books, the only book that I would advise you is Linux Kernel Development by Robert Love. I don't know if he's got a fourth edition yet. And also Optimizing Linux Performance by Philip Easel. Those would be the only two books I would go out and buy. And that's it. Any questions right now? I'd like to take a short break here. I've got 20 minutes after the hour. Can we come back at half past the hour? Okay. And then we'll start the SysCTL module. So let's take a little break here. We'll, we'll see you in uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> 